Welcome. Good evening. Thank you all for being here. My name is Bryant Baker. I am the Conservation Director of Los Padres Forest Watch. Uh, Los Padres Forest Watch, we are an organization. We've been around uh, since 2004. We are based in Santa Barbara. We do conservation work throughout the Central Coast region. Mostly we work on trying to protect the Los Padres National Forest and some other public lands nearby. Uh, we do this through a variety of, of methods. We do a lot of educational work. That's one of the things we're doing here tonight, uh, educating folks about, about bats and their, their role in, in our ecosystems and in our communities. Uh, we also, uh, we, we act as a watchdog organization. So we actually keep, keep an eye on what projects are being proposed uh, on public lands, things like oil drilling, logging, mining. Uh, we try to uh, make sure that anything that's being done on public lands in the region is following environmental regulations, and uh, we try to minimize destructive activities uh, locally uh, on these lands. So we are joined again. Uh, this is, I think, two times in a row. Uh, this is our, we, we just had a webinar not too long ago featuring Miguel Ordignana, who is a wildlife biologist at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, where he has been there. Uh, he's been there since 2013, and uh, perhaps best known for his work on mountain lions, which is what he was presenting on. Uh, gosh, that that wasn't very long ago. That was only like a month, a couple of months ago, I think. Um, which it was a really great, uh, a great presentation. Hopefully, uh, a lot of you joining us tonight, uh, you know, virtually got to see that. And for those of you watching at home, uh, after the fact, um, you know, you can still go and and look at that presentation that is on our website that is on our YouTube. Uh, there's I, I can even put, you know, a link somewhere to uh, direct you to our past webinars, and you can you can check that out. So we're really, really thankful and excited to have Miguel back. He is just a wealth of knowledge. He has been doing a lot of amazing work in the LA area. And tonight he's going to talk to us about some of his research on bats in in Los Angeles in the Los Angeles area. Uh, so with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Miguel. And uh, again, for those of you joining us in person or in you know virtually here tonight, uh, just make sure to put your questions at any time. You can put questions in the in the Q and A, uh, but we will we'll ask those after the presentation is done, and you can keep chatting in the uh, in the chat. All right, thanks. All right, thank you for having me again, Bryant. This is uh, really fun to be here. Um, great audience last time with great questions and um, enthusiasm for um, nature education, uh, which is all I could ask for. Um, this title, the first part of this title, I cannot take credit for, but I, I was so impressed with it that I definitely, appreciated it. I probably will use this title on future talks. Um, but yeah, the acronym BATS, bats aren't that scary. Um, I don't know who's responsible for that, but they should get a, a reward, a promotion or something. Um, but um, the main thing I'm going to talk about, yes, I'm going to give you an overview of bats. Um, and it's Halloween time, so I'm sure everybody's kind of thinking about bats right now or reminded about bats because uh, it's all over um, social media and popular media this time of year. Um, but my goal today is, is yeah, to, yes, um, kind of highlight some of these myths and, and rumors and um, and kind of the, the culture um, of fear that, that bats have created, um, but kind of uncovering the truth about bats, at least in Los Angeles. I'm not a bat expert. Um, I don't know everything about bats, but um, I've done a lot of work in, with regarding community science, um, research with bats in urban Los Angeles. And so, what I, I'm going to share what I've learned through that, um, and hopefully at the end of this, you'll be a little bit more knowledgeable about bats, or at least bats in LA. And um, if you were kind of on the fence about how you felt about bats, hopefully you have a little bit more compassion for bats after this. Um, so whenever people usually think about bats, or at least their first kind of thoughts about bats or introductions to bats, um, 
and if they closed their eyes or did a quick Google search on just bats or bat in the um, Google image uh, search, this is likely one of the first images you'll get um, or something similar of a flying fox. For one, uh, they're really well known because whenever bats are used in movies, a lot of times it's this bat. Um, they're very charismatic to some people because they have that uh, fox-like face. Um, but also they, they freak people out as well because of their size. They're the biggest of the bats, so the flying foxes. Um, some can have wingspans of up to five feet, uh, which is pretty impressive. Um, but I'm starting with this bat because yes, it's familiar and people probably thought of this or of this bat or come across this bat before on TV or on the internet. Um, but also it allows me the opportunity to talk about the diversity of bats out there, the diversity of the bat community globally and the different types of eco ecological services they provide us with. Um, and so the flying fox, just to start with this one, um, is a fruit eating bat, it's a frugivorous bat. Uh, so they eat uh, fruit and tropical fruits. And of course they have to poop uh, that out and they poop the seeds out. And that helps um, keep these forests healthy and regenerate forests. And I think that last part is something that a lot of people don't think about. Um, and research has shown that um, bats, uh, flying foxes and other species are more willing to fly over clear cut areas um, than birds or some species of birds at least. So um, because bat, excuse me, obviously an animal is very vulnerable if there's not a lot of tree canopy cover and they're flying through that or over that. Um, and, but bats are more willing to do it than, than birds and they're pooping as they do that. And so they're responsible for a lot of the regeneration of, of forests, um, which is great. And so, um, so, that, so that's one way we can uh, learn to appreciate bats. Um, and of course, as fruit bats keeping our fruit plantations healthy and, and, and trees healthy, that and um, abundant makes uh, our groceries cheaper at the store. Um, and on the other side of the spectrum, this is the bumblebee bat. This is the smallest bat in the world. Uh, it's from Thailand, type of horseshoe bat. Um, but it's tiny, it, obviously it, it can fit on the, the tip of your finger. And this is a insect eating bat. And, um, and that it makes up the majority of bats. Most majority of bats are um, insect eating bats, but it's Halloween. So I gotta, I gotta talk about Dracula for a second um, um, and vampire bats, of course. Um, so Vampire bats um, were given their name by European explorers who were visiting Latin America in the early 1800s and encountered these bats and sent home stories and did some nature journaling, which is a little, which it had a lot of embellishment in it. And so they created this reputation for vampire bats um, based on their stories and, and their, their natural history recordings so that the vampire bats gain this really scary reputation as these aggressive bats that just suck the blood out of you and all of them have diseases and all this type of stuff. And so uh, Abraham Stoker, actually known as Bram Stoker, um, capitalized on this, not only capitalized on the fear people had of, of this particular bat or bats in general, but also at the time, the late 1800s, um, Modern medicine or Western medicine wasn't what it is like today. Um, and so there's a lot of people dying from diseases that are now curable or preventable. And so there's a lot of death all, away, all, all around us, all around them at all times and, um, and sickness and, and a lot of fear and fear of death and fear of disease and all that kind of stuff. So he was able to combine this fear people had of this really dangerous disease carrying vampire bat and the fear people had based on the current situation. Um, and so that kind of heightened the fear people had of bats. And then, then associating with uh, a character like Dracula, oh my goodness, what else could they possibly do to, for, to demonize this species? Uh, the truth about these bats is that they're adorable. Um, vampire bats are, um, evolved from insect eating bats um, and have these little tiny teeth and they make these incisions 
mostly in uh, forest dwelling animals that are out at night roaming through the forest like deer uh, and sometimes cattle that are roaming through the forests um, at night. And they'll make incisions and um, drop their saliva in there, which is an anticoagulant. And so the blood kind of oozes out and they're able to lap that up uh, like a cat would milk. Um, and it's very cute if you ever look at a YouTube video of that. Um, and so that's what they do. Yeah, they're, they're, they're kind of a parasitic animal. And um, yes, sometimes that they can uh, carry disease, but for the most part, these bats don't want anything to do with us. They're going after forest dwelling, larger mammals that are out in the forest, easily available out there for them, and they're not aggressive and seeking us out. So I just wanted to, to clarify that for people. And also, vampire bats do not live in North America. They live in Latin America and Mexico and further south in Latin America. So if you are still kind of have the heebie-jeebies of with uh, regards to vampire bats and being around us, they're just not here. They're not around us here. Um, other types of bats are um, nectar feeding bats. So um, these bats are, are you know, when they're not drinking from uh, nectar feeders, uh, like this one is a hummingbird feeder, feeders, excuse me. Um, they're going after nocturnal flowering plants like agave and other um, succulents and, and cacti out there that have a lot of flowers that open at night. Um, there are only a few species that are out pollinating these flowers um, and uh, like moths, sphinx moths, for instance. Um, but by um, these bats going after this nectar and rubbing, uh, rubbing up against the pollen of these flowers and then transferring that to the, to the next flower they visit, and very um, integral uh, regarding with regards to pollinating these types of plants. Um, and so if you like tequila or mar your margarita on a hot day, um, you have these bats to thank for that because they're really important with regards to pollinating these agave plants. Some fun facts, um, there's about 14, over 1400 species of bats out there. Um, over t which makes them over 20% of all mammal species. Um, they're unusually long lived for their size. Um, and so that's something I really like to highlight because a lot of people say bats are rats with wings or rodents with wings, and they really don't have the same natural history at all. It's basically the opposite, which makes them really unique and interesting, but also very vulnerable. So, um, so I'll go more into this. So if you're a rabbit or a rat and you reproduce a bunch and only live um, uh, a short amount of time, it's okay because you're uh, killing one of these rabbits or a rat dying is just a drop in the bucket. And that's the mentality people have about bats. People feel like if they're rats with wings, they have the, probably the same natural history. And if you kill one of these bats, that's okay. It's just a drop in the bucket. It's not the case. They actually have one, one to two babies a year uh, for the most part. And so um, for, for you to kind of take some out or, or a colony out, uh, that's a huge hit to the population. Um, and so anyway, so they kind of have the life history of a larger mammal, which are tend to be more vulnerable to extinction. Um, and so um, they save the agricultural bit industry billions of dollars a year as well, um, because they act as natural pest control. So instead of farmers having to use uh, money on pesticide, these bats are killing those crop pests for them uh, free of charge and without them having to, to put all these toxins out in the ecosystem by putting pesticides out. Um, and so that's just a huge service that they provide for us and which ultimately, again, makes our groceries cheaper at the grocery store. Um, and the majority of all bats um, eat insects and echolocate. Um, echolocation is where bats send out this ultrasonic sound that bounces off an object back, back to their specialized ears and brain so they can process that mental, that sound into a mental image to see what's in front of them. Um, and they use this to navigate, to hunt, and to communicate. All LA County bats, which is where I'm at, eat insects, period. Um, there aren't any nectar feeding bats, no fruit bats, no vampire bats. All of them are insectivorous bats. And most bats can see just as well as we can for the most part um, as with regarding being able to see um, during the day. Um, and so 
they, um, but unlike us, they don't have a headlight or a flashlight to use. Um, instead, what they do is they use sound, they use the echolocation. Um, but there are some cave dwelling bats that can't see, but blind as a bat really isn't really a good uh, phrase because it's just really not um, the truth it's, for the most part. Most bats can see just as well as we can. They just don't have lights to aid them as like we do. So yeah, like I said, they use echolocation and bats are um, kind of undergoing an evolutionary race uh, with moths, which are kind of dropping out of the sky or sending their own signals to jam up uh, the bat signals. And so it's this really interesting uh, evolutionary race to see who can outcompete the other and outsmart the other. Um, so, um, but there's two different types of calls. There's uh, search calls, um, which are um, kind of lower frequency and go further, but get less high definition information. And then there's kind of like the feeding, feeding calls, which are higher pitched um, and give you more high definition information, but don't go as far as far as distance. So uh, just give you a sense of the different types of calls. They have also social calls, which are, seem, seem to be more lower pitched. Um, like I said, there is this evolutionary race. And if I can, if you have your sound on, I'll, I'll uh, let you hear an example of a red bat. Um, Close that out, get back to the, whoop, did I stop sharing? Let's see, hold on, there we go. Um, so um, in LA County, most bat research has been done in our local natural areas where you expect to not only find bats, but just find nature in general. So like the Santa Monica Mountains, the, the San Gabriel Mountains, and so a lot of this research has really not been in the, been conducted in the urban core. So there's leaving this huge data gap out there. And I think this is the case for more most urban ecosystems and where bat or areas where bat research has been done. Just basically a way in the city because the assumption is that there's not many bats there and it's really not worth our time to our efforts are better uh, used in areas where there's a lot more species richness and activity. Uh, which makes sense if you only have um, so many so many resources to go around, um, and our NHM bat collection has really in, inspired me in a way because um, I was able to witness how much how many species were in LA County. So of the 19 species um, in, documented by these studies, 17 are in our collection, and we have four over 400 specimens. Uh, and showing the history of them and how recent they're still being found in LA and all those types of things, but also how, where the data gaps are as well. So it's really, it's really helpful that I am connected to the Natural History Museum for that reason. Um, and also, um, so I started trying to put bat detectors out. So I use special equipment um, that record the species specific calls of bats, uh, species specific echolocations to identify what species are using, using certain areas and which aren't. So I started off with Griffith Park, which is a massive park, urban park. Um, it's 4,000 acres in the middle of LA. Um, and so I thought the LA Zoo would be a good spot to just to start, start looking at this question. And there isn't a lot of expectations, but we ended up finding a species, the Western Mastiff bat, which is thought to be gone from the LA basin for the most part for over 10 years before I got that detection. And so, um, it was a really huge moment for us to, to be able to make that discovery, but it wouldn't have happened if we didn't take a chance, if we didn't look in places where people were continuing to overlook. And then because I worked at a museum, I wanted to look at even smaller urban spaces and see what type of um, oases, um, how, how, what type of refuge they act as for uh, urban bats. And so as you can see, not 4,000 acres, but just three and a half acres in our Nat Natrition Museum and even more part urban part of Los Angeles and South LA. 
and we got five species of bats to the very first week, uh, two species the very first week, and eventually getting the Western red bat, which is a foliage roosting specialist. So not all bats are built equal, just like all carnivores, all rodents are built differently and they have different requirements and urban sensitivities. And the red bat, because it only roosts in foliage, they can only stop in places where there's enough tree canopy cover and foliage for it to feel safe uh, during the day and roost. And so for that bat to roost in our little tiny nature gardens multiple times, or use the nature gardens, we can't confirm you, they roosted there, using the nature gardens, this says a lot about how important even the smallest green spaces are, even if it's a, a backyard, apartment courtyard with vegetation, or a nature gardens like we have, um, a, or even a community garden. And so this is kind of what I'm talking about with regards to species specific calls. So Mexican free-tailed bat, which is the most common bat in LA or in general in, in, in California, um, is, um, has this flatter call, uh, a little bit lower pitched, versus myotis species have higher pitch and their shape looks like hockey sticks. And there, you see the red, that's where it's most intense. Sometimes the bats, the calls are most intense at the beginning, sometimes at the end, sometimes in the middle. And those are ways you can differentiate them as well. Um, and I've also, we also did some LA River uh, acoustic bat research. And that was a little bit uh, sketchier because I had to repel off a pedestrian bridge to, to get that data so that my equipment wouldn't get vandalized. But it was fun, it was worth it. We were able to detect how much, how important the LA River, which is mostly channelized, is to uh, bat species and species that were riparian specialists, for instance. Um, and we got our answer. Mexican free-tailed bats, of course, were there, but we also got these riparian specialists, uh, different myotis species that, and they were the most commonly found um, in, that, in that area. And then we wanted to expand deeper into the urban core. And that's where community science comes in and, and our background and, and the power of community partnerships. And because if you wanna look at LA County, um, most of it is urban residential, probably over 70%. And so if you're not looking there, you're getting just a, uh, not, not a very comprehensive view at what uh, bat habitat is or isn't in LA County. And so community science, if you're not familiar with it, it's where uh, are projects in which volunteers partner with uh, professional scientists to answer real world questions. So questions that matter both to the scientific community and to the public. And it provides us access to areas like residential areas that are just unprecedented um, uh, as far as access um, if you do common, if you do more common types of research. Also you increase the scale of what you do. Um, and because if everybody has a remote sensing device or a app that allows them to detect species from the comfort of their own home and their neighborhoods. Um, you can get way more data and cover a larger area you know, versus if it was just one or two people um, on a research team and a couple of volunteers maybe just going around and trying to collect data. And so we started the backyard bat research project thanks to some initial seed money from the scientific product grant um, from Wildlife Acoustics who make the bat detectors that we use. And so we put them in a few backyards, started rotating them once a month because we only had a few and wanted to cover a good chunk of area. Um, and of the 19 species that were recorded mostly in natural areas on the outskirts of the basin of LA, 12 species were detected that very first year in backyards alone. Um, and these are the 12, these beautiful, cute cotton balls with wings. Um, and just amazing to see the diversity um, of bats in people's backyards and probably one of the most urban cities in the world. Um, and four of these species or species of special concern in the state of California. So that means that these species are vulnerable to human disturbance and urbanization and are at risk, more at risk to extinction uh, in LA compared to other species. So to find these species, not only in LA, but in backyards um, was pretty remarkable and surprising for everybody involved. And our first year, most of our detections were Mexican free-tailed bats as we expected, 
Um, and then second to that were Kenyan bats. Um, um, and so, but that, that trend would, would change. Um, and we got species like the pocketed free-tailed bat, uh, which is a bat that was, its range was thought to be not too much further north than Orange County. So for us to detect it in LA County was a really cool thing and, 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 um, and really was a surprise that we didn't expect. Um, as you can see, that, that's basically going up to Orange County. It's, it's historic range. And so for us to get some LA County records was pretty cool. Silver haired bat was detected a few times and like the bat experts that I was working with, uh, I still work with, uh, were surprised, really surprised, even more so by these detections because they're more of a forest specialist and in, in, um, in um, excuse me, in Bay Area uh, forests or Northern California forests uh, pr predominantly. And so to find these animals, not only in Southern California, but LA backyards, that was just pretty cool um, to be able to detect that multi at multiple sites. Um, so here you can see again, the historic distribution, you see LA really isn't generally part of that. Um, and so Western yellow bats are also another cool story because they're also part of the Lazurus genus, the hairy tailed bat foliage roosting specialists like the red bat and the hoary bat, which I haven't talked about yet. Um, and this bat is roosting in palms um, and not only roost in foliage, specifically prefers to be in palm trees. And so for uh, us to have those iconic palm trees in LA is potentially, potentially allowed this species a special concern to expand its range into LA. Um, so we'll see, um, I mean, as the word spreads and how important this type of tree is to this sensitive bat, I wonder if people's these will change whether they want to remove all the non-native palm trees out of LA. Um, and so and it creates controversy, but um, hopefully um, there's a solution that, that, uh, that provides um, some habitat security for this bat. It's really special and beautiful bat. Hoary bats also very similar. They're a migratory species that migrate from Southern Canada down to Central Latin America and back every year. Um, and most bats are migratory, um, but this bat is definitely one of those that usually only stops in areas where there's enough foliage and tree canopy cover. And, um, and so for this bat to take a visit, have a visit in our gardens, in our nature gardens, this is actually a photo of a hoary bat in our nature gardens, in the Naturist Museum in South LA on the side of our museum wall. And at the time, um, it was the museum was still open and because our um, staff knew about bats or at least enough to recognize it, they brought people over and they put a spotting scope out and they, they got visitors to come and, and check this bat out from a safe distance and just watch it until it flew away uh, once it got dark. It was a pretty amazing moment. Um, big brown bat, that, that was a surprise for us because in most parts of the country, this bat is considered an urban specialist, uh, a bat that is even, even considered a pest in places where a lot of people have addicts. Um, and um, so for this bat, we thought, oh, a Mexican free tail bat, it's gonna be common, but probably the big brown as well, once we start looking in, into urban LA. And it's just not the case. Um, we've, detect, we've studied over 80 sites so far. Um, and all those X's are places where we have not detected the big brown bat. Um, and that number continues to increase as far as places we are not able to detect the big brown bat. And it's, it's a little scary. Um, and I mean, this is a, this is a bat that requires um, a night roost as well. So roost, an additional roost when it's kind of, um, when it's hunting to take a break during the night in addition to its day roost. And so we think that because sometimes it chooses to use like warehouses and other sometimes vulnerable places where animals are exterminated from or that are basically bulldozed, a lot of its habitat might be under threat. Um, so um, anyway, so that's a concern that we never expected. 
And we expanded the work with the support of the Disney Conservation Fund, uh, who allowed us to provide, provide us with more detectors so we can extend the duration of our sampling from a month to a year in each location. So to kind of get some seasonal patterns um, going and also put some detectors in parks to compare to backyards. So we got families involved, um, more families, excuse me, um, and it was a great moment, not only, it was an extractive uh, relationship where we dropped in and took data and left and without basically sharing information. It was a really great partnership. It is a great partnership where we are, yes, putting a detector out there and getting really cool scientific data, but these families are able to make these discoveries hand in hand with us. We, as soon as we know something, we tell them and they're able to connect with nature in a way that they've never had before um, through this project. And everybody um, enjoys it and, and is sad when I have to pull those detectors out of their yards um, every year. And um, as that second year, as we continue to do this work of those 12 species we got that first year, we got um, nine. Um, and and the, as we gotten even to more urban neighborhoods that, okay, now we're going to South Central LA, we're going into neighborhoods like Watts, Compton, Torrance, industrial neighborhoods like Southgate, and we're not gonna find anything. We're just gonna find maybe one species and that's it, maybe here and there. And nine species and even more, and as we kept continuing this study over, over the seasons and what it showed, but also by putting these detectors in parks that were just blocks away from some of these yards, we were able to see that um, these parks, because especially in park poor areas are acting as important oases for these bats, especially those parks with those big lakes or artificial reservoirs, because these bats are eating insects and insects, a lot of their life cycle starts in the water and their activity is really abundant near water. And so that's where the bats wanna be. There's where, that's where all the green space is in those areas. And so we can get 10 times the amount of bat activity in a park compared to a backyard. Not to say that backyards are useless because they are getting multiple species, some of them in the most urban areas. And sometimes because probably there's a palm tree there or there's happens to be more street trees there or overgrown uh, uh, empty lot nearby, who knows? Um, so that's really cool to see. And these families, again, uh, we're, we're using varieties of, of uh, backyards. Sometimes we're using apartment complexes, sometimes we're using um, backyards with all concrete, some with just the lawn, some with native gardens in them, some along a lagoon, all types of sites. Um, and also we're extend, expanding our audience to um, other trusted community centers that people, communities have trust in because this is also a relationship building opportunity for our museum to reach new audiences that we haven't reached before. So we partner with libraries by putting it on the roof or a boys and girls club, also schools. And schools like this one in Watts is has, has great has, and combined with outreach events has really kind of solidified more aware, awareness about nature and a, a stronger connection because these bats are being detected not only in Watts, but these students know that it's, it's being detected right there in their courtyard. And when I do a community outreach event and I say, hey, you have bats here and they, oh yeah, I'm sure they're here in LA, but not here. No, yeah, they are. They're just down the street in, in this particular case, Jordan High School. I'm like, oh, my, my cousin went there or I, I go there. Um, so there's that really personal connection that can't be matched um, that we're able to, to provide. Um, okay, I'm doing okay on time. Um, so, um, so this is another great example. And this is an example of regardless of your background, regardless of where you live, you have the opportunity in our project at least to make a really significant discovery. And so this is a family, this is the Broderick family. They, they live in East Long Beach, a very urban part of Long Beach. They live in an apartment complex there that's just like a lot of other apartment complexes and they have a shared patio space. And I really wanted to kind of fill in some geographic gaps and I was like, hey, um, Broderick, um, the Broderick family um, were visited the museum, so I knew about them. And I, hey, I invited them to participate, and they're like, "Well, I mean, we live live in a really densely urban area. I don't. I think you're better off going somewhere else." Like, actually, I mean, I think I, I really want to show everyone what bats live there, and 
to get you involved because I guarantee you're at least going to get one species of bats. You're like, all right, all right, okay, we'll put it up. So they put it up and um, of all the sites, and like I said, we have a variety of sites. Some are these really beautiful um, homes um, with native gardens and huge landscape, uh, beautiful landscaping that attracts native insects and all types of habitat. And of all the sites, um, this one has probably had the most or close to the most species detected at their site. On top of that, they detected a species a migration event of my Mexican free tail bats that no other site was able to record. So if we didn't put that bat detector in their shared patio space, we would have never detected that species, excuse me, that migration event. Um, and they're so proud of, of all the species they discovered and um, that migration event they're able to document. Um, and 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 really hopefully have some some agency um, that they've grown that that they've gained from that. Um, and again, no matter who you are, I mean, if you design these projects and studies right, anybody has the opportunity to make an important and an extremely huge impact on scientific discovery. Now we're expanding our audience even more by including roost mapping and monitoring. So we're asking community members that. Well, we only have, Disney was generous, but we only have 25 bat detectors to distribute in, in specific geographic locations. But now by asking people to count bats, um, we can open it up to anybody um, to join us um, and for an event where they count bats emerging from, from roosts. Um, the reason why we're asking for this is two reasons. One, the most important reason is to meet the interests of the local community. The local community, wants to, even though they're aware that bats are there, they wanna know where they're living. That is, when I do outreach events, they're like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to know that bats are flying around, but I wanna know where they're living. They wanna know, either wanna know that where they're living because they're concerned or um, because they wanna protect them. They wanna know the physical structure they, they need to know about and how to protect, protect bats or these, their potential roosts. Um, from a scientific standpoint, it's just another data gap. We don't know bat roosts and we don't know their hibernation behavior in LA County really um, in urban areas um, because it, we have this me mild Mediterranean climate. Also um, the, the fungus that leads to white nose syndrome has reached Northern California. This white nose syndrome is a, a disease that has been devastating to bat populations. It's a, it's a fungus um, that really affects, it's contagious and affects cave dwelling bats um, and just keeps them active um, during periods where they should be resting and conserving their energy, especially during the winter. And instead they don't have the energy, um, the resources uh, once it's time to emerge from hibernation. And so anyways, it kills a lot of bats um, and it's went, started in the East Coast in the United States and has moved all the way uh, to Northern California. Um, so for us to kind of be in preventative mode or be able to hopefully manage bats if white nose ever does reach Southern California, uh, we got to know where they're roosting. We got to know their roosting behavior. We got to know where they're hibernating. We got to know what species are vulnerable um, and what type of roost they prefer. We need to know that basic information for us to have a bigger conservation impact. And that's so that's the goal from that standpoint. And so we're joining in this national effort called the NABAT um, Summer Emergence Count. And we did our first round this past summer, once uh, in June to get bats before the pups are volant. And then in August, after the pups are volant to get a second count of those roosts. So uh, it's a really engaging opportunity. Um, and, and if you're from LA County, um, there's a way to participate. You can either email us at bats at nhm.org, visit our website. Uh, we can provide these links later. Um, and also there's a form if you actually want to report a roost to us. And so this is the experience. People kind of wait out and beautiful, look at the beautiful sunset, mostly along uh, the LA River, um, San Gabriel River, and, and freeway underpasses where we know of urban bat roosts right now. And we're trying to learn about more so we can map and count more. This is another cool story that hopefully uh, speaks to you all as well. So these is a, this is a family, the Tamayo family that 
wanted to join one of our roost counts and their kid had such a blast that his name is um, Beckett that he decided, he told his mom right after, I wanna to go to the library and check out every bat book I can. Uh, and this was his first introduction to bats. And so I see this is just an opportunity that this family might not have had without these types of events. And other partners uh, like Friends of the Los Angeles River are stepping up and creating bat guides, spreading awareness, not only about bats to uh, the typical nature enthusiast community, um, but making it fun, making it engaging. Going, have we just had a bats and brews event at a local brewery along the LA River, um, and they made these bilingual guides to make sure that we're also reaching the Spanish speaking community, which is huge in LA. So I really appreciate that, especially as a person that identifies with that community. Um, and so um, our next next year, we're gonna focus on a new region going uh, from Compton North up the LA River, engaging more communities through uh, bat detecting and survey, uh, roost surveys. Um, and if you are um, thinking about, hey, I'm not, I mean, I, I, these are really cool stories, but I live in really urban area. Um, this is a great, story that convinces hopefully anyone that they have a potential roost in their neighborhood, regardless of where that is. This is a tow-away sign in a strip mall um, in a suburb of LA. And it's also a bat roost, believe it or not. Um, this is a, a bat right behind there, kind of crammed in there. And if you still don't believe me, here's a nice video clip. Oh, didn't play, I'll hit play. <laughs> the bat tried to get in there, missed his mark, and then went back and uh, made it in the little crevice, which is pretty cute. Um, and I like to end with this story here. This is uh, me at a football game, a USC football game. Um, I'm a big football fan, and uh, I was there with my family, my my brother is like, hey, Miguel, there's bats eating moths around the stadium lights. And I was like, oh, really? That's cool. Um, and of course, because I'm a bat nerd, I had a bat detector in my pocket at a football game. And I stood up during the middle of the game. It wasn't halftime, probably uh, angered some people behind me. Um, but I wanted to listen for bats and see what species were flying around. Um, and it was, of course, a Mexican free tail bat, the most common bat in, in L.A., and um, it was just an amazing moment for me and my family to just be at this, in this familiar space because we had to been to a lot of games before, the marching band playing, the crowd cheering, and also being able to isolate the sound of nature and be able to connect with nature in just an unexpected way. Um, but the biggest kind of take home for me is that this is where I hope um, this type of work goes. As this technology gets cheaper, as it gets more accessible, as more people are aware of bats through bilingual guides and bat talks and um, just museum exhibitions, et cetera, more people are going to think about bats and want to be stewards of bats. And they know the truth about bats and how important they are to our ecosystem. One day, there'll be a stadium full of people expecting to see a bat and standing up at halftime, all listening for bats. And I'm not just gonna be that weird random weirdo in the stadium like I was that day. Um, and that's, I'll leave it at that. Um, and I'm just, I'm just really proud of where we've come as far as um, our, our community, as far as being uh, more appreciative and understanding of bats and compassionate towards bats because we need them. If you don't like getting bit by mosquitoes, um, and you don't like moths flooding around and eating holes in your clothes, um, we want bats around. They keep our ecosystem in balance, just like carnivores do, if you're at my carnivore talk. And so um, I hope you have a better understanding of them and think about um, doing what you can to, to be a conservation advocate for bats. Um, that most, a lot of people ask, how can I help bat conservation? And a lot of that is being an advocate. Uh, it's not necessarily, yeah, funding uh, efforts like like this or um, nonprofits that 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 do uh, bat conservation, but yeah, bat boxes are helpful. Um, but 
bigger than bat boxes, especially in areas that have a lot of good habitat, uh, roosting habitat, is just getting bat people aware of bats and their importance. Because bats might be, people might be aware that bats are there, but they not might not understand what their role is, what their importance is, what their sensitivities are. Um, and so think about that when you see your neighbors putting pesticides out on their plants or in their gardens or in their landscaping, because that all goes through the food web and affects bats and the insects that they eat. Um, also, when you tr tr consider trimming trees, don't do it when pups aren't volant and able to kind of get out of there and, and protect themselves. Um, trim your trees. And if you have a snag or ugly tree, um, don't cut it down just because it's ugly, because those snags and dead trees are probably the most prime, prime, the best habitat for bat roost. Um, so anyways, those are a handful of things um, that answer that really popular question. So, but now I'm happy to answer more. Yeah. Wow. Thank you, oh, Miguel. Thank you. That was, um, that was awesome. I learned so much and I have a lot of questions myself, but we're getting some great questions from the audience. While we're sort while it's sort of fresh on everyone's mind, okay. So the you holding up the the bat detector at a at a UCF or a, what was it a USC game? Yeah, that's like that's iconic. That should be um, that should be on the cover of your book about bat. You know your work with bats. But uh, people were asking. So you, it looked like you were using a bat, some sort of thing, some device that you attach to your phone. Can can you talk a little bit about that and where people can maybe people are interested in getting something like that and using yeah it yeah yeah thanks for the interest and and it's it's made by wildlife acoustics that's the company it's called the echo meter and so it is like a little attachment that you put on the lightning port of your phone or your apple phone or um your uh, ipad um also they make an android version if you don't have an apple device um and basically it's it the cheapest ones cost about like 150 bucks uh, or 200, something around there. And then the, the more expensive ones are like 350. Um, and anyway, um, the, the manufacturers also came up with an, a free app that also has a library of calls so that can match whatever you're listening to live with uh, a particular species, or at least give you a guesstimate. It's not the most robust in my opinion, uh, library, but at least gives you like a rough guess of what's flying around you. Uh, uh, what the, yeah the app what's the app you're using the app is called let me actually look at my phone uh, <laughs> i'm writing all this down acoustics oh. wildlife uh, acoustics echo meter echo meter app okay so wildlife acoustics echo meter app so it, it's an app that's actually associated with their detector because you said exactly. it was a detector made by wildlife acoustics okay yeah. so, so hopefully app, everybody is, is is just for that device yeah okay uh, awesome i <laughs> I have a new a new hobby maybe because um, every time I'm camping out in the Los Padres, if if we're near trees, we always you know there's always bat activity. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it looks like some folks are, uh, you know, talking in the chat about some of the things that they're they're using as well. Cool. So um, that was just so so cool. So somebody asked, uh, it, while we're on that topic, kind of you know in terms of the the detecting bats so are they producing ultrasonic so they're producing ultrasonic sounds that most we, cases yeah, yeah the most we, cases yeah but mm -hmm. we but are they producing sounds that we can also detect with our ears yeah, yeah. so I, that's why i said most cases so the western massive bat which is that that big bat that um that i sh that I showed that i got in griffith park that was just a species that we thought was gone for about a decade um is the biggest bat in North America, has a wingspan of almost two feet, and it has a very low frequency call, about six to 10 kilohertz, somewhere around there. Um, and that is with well within our range of hearing. Our range of hearing is up to 20 kilohertz. And so above 20 kilohertz is ultrasonic sound. Um, and so there are bats, and also even bats that um, have ultrasonic calls, when they're doing social calls, those tend to be lower. And so we can hear those as well uh, when they're like in the roost kind of chatting to each other and talking about who knows what. Um, so, so yeah, there are some calls that we can hear for sure. 
Okay, awesome. Yeah, that was a good good question. I was wondering that myself. Um, okay, cool. So we have we have a lot of questions. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to make my way through them. And and folks who are with us tonight, just remember you can put questions in the Q and A. You can you can type them in the chat. I I may miss them. I've been trying to write them down um, in a separate. Uh, on a separate sheet so that I, I'm keeping track. And, and I got to start with the very first question that we got. Do bats have visible butts? Where, where are the, where are the bat butts? This is, this is, these are important questions that we have to answer, Miguel. They're under the tail. Yeah. Like most animals, like their, their anus is right under the tail. Um, yeah. So, so that's, that's where their, their butts are. There you have it, folks. <laughs> They've got butts. They're they're there. They're under the tail. You know, I I would be amazed if most people probably will never get to see a bat butt in person. I mean, I, I've spent so much time out out in the you know out in the wild and um and I've seen bats quite often, but it's always just like a it's a whoosh. You know, it, you don't really see them so much as you just sort of hear them and feel their presence. But uh, uh, that was another question I guess I had for you was. Did, was there, is there any point when you guys are doing research, when you're collecting data, is there ever any time, and maybe you mentioned this, where you do capture and release kind of like with some, sometimes that's done with birding, birding? Yeah. I mean, yeah, there are some bat research that do that. And there's a really good reason for that. Um, it's, it's, it's really helpful to use to verify what species that are actually there. Like recordings can be really accurate, especially with using the right library calls. Um, but um, it's, it's nothing like getting the actual physical animal in a net and, and verifying that species is there. So that's one reason to do that. But uh, another reason is also to put a transmitter on them. And for us, we hope that's the next step for our study in the future is to tag some bats, to follow where they're roosting, how they're using the urban environment, um, because Rat, bat roost counts and acoustic research only can go so far. Um, and so we really know, want to know how they're using this urban environment now that we know what species are there and generally what species are where. So, um, yeah. So you've gotten to actually see them up close and in person, which I have um, fortunately. Yeah. yeah but, um, that's awesome. um, and also, unfortunately, like there's a lot of bats that get injured and, we have a bat local bat rehab group, South Coast um, bat rehabbers um, that do take in injured bats. And a lot of, um, unfortunately, there's a lot of rehabbers that don't take in bats. Um, and so we're, ha we're lucky to have a rehab facility here in LA that takes on bats. And, and when they can, they re-release them back into the wild. Um, we have someone tonight in the audience who's a bat a bat rehabber. I did not awesome. catch where they where they're located. They may put it in the chat. Um, okay, so let me move on to some other some other questions. And and I have to say the chat has been really great. Um, this has been a very engaged audience. They've they've been having a good time in the in the chat. So um, I, I always like to see that. I may have instigated a, a little bit of that too. Um, <laughs> so you talked early on about vampire bats and uh, someone. Someone asked, you know, are they the, the vampire bats that live in other countries? Are they are they actually dangerous to people? I mean, do 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 they actually bite people? That seems to be the common thought. I mean, they can carry disease, uh, but I would say like like rabies is a concern. I'm not going to say rabies isn't a thing. I, I mean, and bats don't carry it because they do. Uh, I think the misconception is that when a bat gets rabies, it's all it's a super bat. It's a super aggressive, and it's 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 um, I mean, it's dangerous because it has the disease in it, but it's not ultra aggressive all of a sudden. It actually gets usually more lethargic, is doing weird things like being active during the day. Um, so the safe thing to do is to be safe is like bats look acting weird, like flying around during the day on the ground. Don't touch it um, and don't approach it. Um, call your local rehabber and and get it some help, hopefully, and hopefully it doesn't have rabies. But anyway, um, but it's not as common as people think. Rabies, not all bats have rabies, um, and it's just overblown for sure. All yeah. right, good. So vampire bats, so good you're asking about vampire bats. Um, where vampire bats exist, um, yeah, they can be. I mean, in, in parts of the country, 
Um, there is a risk, but again, they're going after mostly um, forest dwelling animals. They're not going after people um, for the most part. Um, and not to say it doesn't happen, um, but humans are, are, are not as vulnerable as these animals that are out in the wild, out in the open at night. Great, okay. So not only do we not have vampire bats, they're really not trying to get you. So <laughs> don't, don't worry too much about them. Um, and uh, I think you, that same person actually asked about how common rabies, you know, how, yeah. how common it is, in, at least in our area, in terms of biting and rabies. Like how, it, it seems like that's pretty uncommon, but it does happen from time to time. But yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know what the most recent stat, but a stat that I saw once was like one to two cases a year in, in the U.S. or something like, yeah, I think the U.S. or something like that. So okay, it's, so it's not as, yeah, it's not as common as people think it is. It might be even less common than, than something like shark attacks or something. So, um, yeah. okay. Um, somebody asked, uh, Dennis asked, what what is the bat's natural predator? Uh, what's their natural enemy besides humans? Yeah, that's a good question. So like the their predators would likely mostly be like, um, at least at night, it'd be the owls um, and and um, occasionally a snake, um, especially if like you're a cave dwelling bat, where if you're a bat in the cave, uh, that or there are caves in the country, um, and um, but if like you're in a palm tree in like urban area, like you're vulnerable to rats, right? That like, rats can like find you and and get at you. Um, so um, so that's another. Another risk, especially if, if a bat is a pup and it's not volant, like it's 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 vulnerable to to even rodents and things like that. What, what about cats? Um, yeah, cats too. Yeah, it's a yeah. good one. Yeah, they yeah. they can climb trees. Um, like another reason to keep your cats indoors. I mean, I don't want to preach. I preach this almost every time, but like I I'm all about uh, people keeping cats indoors. For one, I've I've had this. Uh, experience as a child where my first pet was a cat named whiskey and it was killed by a pack of coyotes and so that was because I left my cat outside and also they kill thousands of birds and millions of birds and lizards every year even those fat fluffy cats that you think is not going to do anything but sleep during the day they're also really talented effective killers um, so please keep your cats indoors <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I, you know, I was thinking this, so what you've been finding. Oh, out, Steve oh, Schubert said peregrine falcons. Peregrine falcons. Oh, right. Dusk. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Like, yeah. All those animals that are hunting at dusk, which is, there's a lot of overlap at dusk, but yeah, I could totally see that. Yeah. I, I, I would not want to be a, a small flying creature anywhere where there are peregrine falcons those uh, <laughs> those are some hardcore birds oh i want to give a shout out though to the mexican free tail bat again it's like the coyote the the bats. i'm always i'm always so i'm, I'm just a, a mexican free tail bat fan um it's the coyote of this the the bats because it's so adaptive to so many different environments um and it's a really strong flyer and a very fast flyer i think it's gotten clocked at over 100 miles an hour and sustain that speed for a good amount of distance. And I, I, I saw, I mean, this confirmed, I saw, I read this a, a while ago, but then I saw it confirmed that this really cool PBS Nova documentary, I'm sure a lot of you have seen, and someone actually, a scientist actually was flying a plane to, to track that and track their speed. So amazing, just amazing bat. I just want to give them a shout out. Bats, <laughs> bats aren't, aren't spooky they're 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 like adrenaline junkies they're oh, yeah. uh, they're hardcore yeah. um, they can live like to like 30 years 40 years in some cases wow. yeah pretty impressive yeah that's awesome the more i learn about them the more i just am in love with them i do want to point out some somebody said i i i did put in the chat i i mentioned i had a question which was for everyone which was do you think cat, bats are cute and i said of course the answer is Yes, obviously, and a lot of people did. <laughs> but somebody who I believe is also our our um, our bat rehabber who's in the audience, she mentioned that you know it, it's it's easy to um, to get people kind of mixed up in thinking that 
perhaps bats would make good pets, you know, if we, if we're saying they're cute too often. And I thought that was a really good point. We, we don't want to encourage people to keep bats as pets. That is not the goal here. Uh, I, I think bats are really cool and I want people to not be scared of them and I want them to appreciate them, but please do not try to keep bats as pets. Right, would you agree with that? I totally agree with that. And um, I think another reason why that's a bad idea is um, yes, they'd make a mess, of course, of all the poop and flying around and all that kind of stuff. But also, uh, a more serious note, um, they're rarely at zoos or in captivity in general. Um, and there's only a few exceptions for that, um, just because they just don't do well in captivity. They need space. And the only reason to have them in captivity is if they're injured and need to be rehabbed. And it should be just kept at that period. Great. Yeah. I, so just please, if you take anything away from, from tonight, don't, don't try to keep yeah. a bat as a pet that we have that's dogs, cats. I mean, they're, they're great pets. We don't, we don't need to be keeping bats. Um, and, and so, <laughs> uh, so, okay, let's, let's see. We've had so many good questions. Somebody asked what, when is a bat going to be a cute, a cute sidekick? I'm saying cute again. Um, <laughs> when, are, when are they going to be a sidekick to a Disney princess? And I, I, I'm remembering there was definitely a bat in that animated Anastasia film, but that wasn't Disney. And I don't know, that bat may have been a, a suspicious character. Um, yeah, they're always bad characters. I mean, yeah. I would love a Disney movie that makes them good, but I mean, um, there's, uh, there's reasons to not want that too, right? Like, because right. there's a history of like, for instance, raccoons history. They, there was this popular cartoon or comic in ja Japan that that made raccoons revered and, and in huge demand. And so a lot of people started importing raccoons and having them as pets and they became pests as people re realized raccoons do not make good pets. And so anyways, we don't want that to happen to bats, but I do like the idea of having them more as a celebrated character um, in popular media. Yeah. I totally agree with that. I, I grew up, you know, one of those children, those children's books that I remember from, from when I was a kid, um, that really stuck with me. And I still remember it to this day is a, a book called Stella Luna. And it was mm -hmm. about a bat and it was a great, I, I remember it being a great book. I haven't read it, reread it since, but, um, it was one of my favorites that my mom would read to me. It's so a classic. Yeah. yeah. And my daughter reads it. It's in awesome. English and Spanish. It's very popular and, and great book. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of folks in the chat are, are saying it's, they, they, they like that book as well. Um, so we had some other questions about bat houses. Um, and so, so somebody said they tried to post a, they tried to put up a bat house, but it didn't seem to work. You know, what, do, do you have any advice on that? Or do you have any advice on trying to get bats to go use the bat house and not be in your house? Yeah. So um, I'm not a bat house expert. This is probably the most common question I get. Um, but um, some great websites to look for more research is Bat Conservation International. But I've also sent people to these websites that are really detailed and helpful. But I've heard also by local bat experts that um, bat houses don't typically do well or are successful here in Southern California. Um, and it's, I think, a lot of it is because of our temperature and a lot of the recommendations that are in these um, uh, websites are saying a post and a poll and putting on top of a poll. And I think for them to be successful or having a chance of success, uh, people recommend um, that, of course, that they're facing, getting sun first thing in the morning. So facing that direction um, and also being set up along on on the side of, of a bridge or if, if it's not a house um, or the side of a house um, so it's it's connected to more mass so that it doesn't it holds the heat longer um, and is able to kind of warm up quickly if it's facing the sun um, in the morning and and once it gets that heat it doesn't lose it at night as fast as if it was on a pole or something like that but even in the perfect situation um and you follow all the the directions correctly 
Um, and also, yes, again, one another thing is like the mass issue, like getting the bigger bat boxes um, increases your chances of success as, as well because it increases the amount of mass. Um, but even the best situations where everything is done correctly, bats also take a while to get comfortable with these things. And I've heard like it takes up to three years sometimes for these bats to use and occupy these roosts finally. Um, also, um, if you live in a area that, excuse me, has a lot of trees and a lot of great roosting habitat, they're going to choose that over your bat box um, because it's, it's, it's more natural. It's, it's probably what they're more familiar with and adapted to. Um, but it's, it doesn't hurt to try. I mean, to be honest, I, I appreciate and I applaud people for, for building the boxes and, and giving it a shot. Interesting. Um, yeah, that's, that sounds like a, 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 a fun project, but could be, um, can be a lot of work and, uh, yeah, and I mean, you don't want to like tell your kid like, "Oh, right, we're gonna build it, and bats are gonna show up." Like, you don't want right. to put their hopes up too high because, I mean, but also you can spin it like, "Oh, they're not using it because we have good bat habitat in our neighborhood or something like that." I don't know. Yeah, and I was thinking I meant to ask you this earlier, but um, your findings in LA, it, it generally seems to indicate that where you, even just a little bit of open space here and there is 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 providing um habitat you know whether it's really good habitat or it's enough is, an, is another question but it, at least they are able to utilize the habitat that's there and yeah. it's one of the many reasons we know that open space is so important my question for you is do you think that your findings in la would apply to other cities like maybe oxnard or ventura or, or you know smaller smaller cities like like santa barbara what what do you what do you think about that I, I think so. I mean, I think the case of LA is is unique in which I think there's a lot of LA that's park poor, that's very industrial. So if you get into places like Oxnard, um, it's it's not as urb, densely urban. So um, there's there's a lot of alternatives for bats. When bats have not a lot of choices, then um, of course they're going to use whatever is available. Um, so that increases the value of these smaller, tiny patches of habitat um, compared to a community garden in an area that's right up against the forest or an oak woodland habitat. So, um, so anyways, I, yeah, so that's kind of what I was getting at. But I, what also I wanted to say was that um, these little patches of habitat are not only helping out these urban adapted bats, but also surprisingly important, providing important refuge for some really sensitive, urban sensitive bats that are just really desperate for roosting habitat, especially ones that are migrating and need, need a break along their journey. Um, so anyway, yeah, good question. So I wanna move to a couple of questions that are about vegetation, particularly about what what types of vegetation they seem to be utilizing and are attracted to. You've, you've mentioned palms a little bit in, in LA in LA specifically. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and sort of as a related question, people are wanting to know what what is a general time that you want to avoid tree trimming or, or cutting? You, you mentioned that earlier and um, I believe it was it had to do with when pups, um, I don't know, you said you were, you were, you were saying pups a lot, which I, I thought was a great <laughs> name for baby, yeah. for little bats. But um, yeah, if you could just speak to that a little bit, that'd be great. Yeah, as far as the type of trees, I'm not, I'm not really sure. Um, there hasn't, to my knowledge, been any local studies um, to find like what trees are most attractive. But I'd imagine ones that have um, thick foliage um, and dense foliage, excuse me, like sycamores and oaks and things like that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I can't really speak more to that. Um, but the, what's cool about the hoary bats, the hairy tail bats, I mean, they're hairy because they're more exposed to the evolent, excuse me, the, the elements than, um, than other bats that are roosting in crevices that are protected from the elements. So, um, so anyways, um, they're adapted to be a little bit of exposure um, because of 
the fact that they're roosting out on trees, even if they're on the underside of a leaf, they're still exposed. Um, so, but um, the other question was, can you repeat the last part? Of that? Uh, when, when is the time, when is the time yeah, you the last, avoid yeah, so, cutting? Yeah. Um, it's basically when, um, let's see, I always get this mixed up, but it's, it's when they are basically having maternity roosts and having babies. So, so that goes into basically the fall and early summer um, is when it seems to be that they're most vulnerable because they're less mobile and um, providing for their pups at that time. And then once the pups are vulnerable, which is like August-ish, at least over here, it seems like, um, or even mid July, I don't know. I would be say August or September to be safe. Um, and at that point, um, at least they have a chance. At least they can fly out, uh, the pups can fly out um, and escape if, if someone is disturbing that, that roost. Um, but if anybody is a, has a better I idea on the calendar, please put that in the chat because I, I could have messed that up. <laughs> yeah, that's all, that's all right. Um, and, and it may be different based on where you are, you know, exactly. what, what, yeah. what place you're in. Um, and and it, it's okay if you don't know. I mean, I, I think, I think that's what you were sort of getting at was it's, it's hard to know the exact like native trees that they might be yeah. uh, really utilizing. Don't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's we something. don't really know anything about their roosting habitat at all, whether they're foliage specialists or crevice roosters aside from that. Yeah. They'll use bridges. Um, and okay. people's eaves and people's entrances and attics and garages. And I mean, right. but as far as what species prefers what, I mean, that is also something we need to figure out. Right. Yeah. People are mentioning too, you don't want to be trimming trees or cutting trees um, or, or, you know, doing much with vegetation in the spring either, because that's when birds tend to be nesting. And so, mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, it's almost as if <laughs> wildlife are, uh, you know, I mean, they can be vulnerable throughout much of the year, and yeah, we have exactly. to be very, we have to be very careful about what we're doing as as a society. Um, and and I think a lot of people had questions about. Um, I, I think we we talked about this earlier about what their natural predators are, but obviously humans are a big reason why we we've had declines in some populations. I, I'm assuming because of habitat fragmentation and, and loss, mostly. Exactly. Is that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so yeah i mean that and that's a that's um a common a common theme with a lot of stories about you know what we know about certain species and and why we see population declines it has a lot to do with the fact that we're we're building roads and new developments and um you know but i i also gotta say i we have to redefine what habitat is sure and, and and especially when we're talking about a particular species like if, if we're talking about habitat and just saying, hey, protect those oak woodland of those canyons and classic um, suitable habitat for most wildlife, we're sometimes overlooking habitat that is extremely important for, for instance, the big brown bat, which are sometimes a lot of human made structures. Um, and, 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 and also like, if it's snags and dead trees that people see as a lot of times disposable or as, as creating fire risk or things like that, um, I think we need to think about bats before we just kind of just totally wipe entire sections out. Um, and maybe there's some sort of compromise we can reach. If anyone uh, has seen any of my presentations or follows me on Instagram, you would know that I am obsessed with dead trees. Um, I, I think <laughs> snags are some of the most in, invaluable habitat uh, out there. And it goes for a lot of different species, not just bats. So please have some, have some love for the dead trees. They are, <laughs> they are still teeming with life generally. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's really good to keep in mind, Miguel. I, I, I sometimes forget as I work mostly on public land issues, I, I, it, these, ur these more urban environments can be really complex. And I think in a place like the LA basin where human structures are not going away, you know, anytime soon, um, mm -hmm. it's important to know what, 
which structures or what types of buildings and structures are, are being utilized by, by bats so that we can try to protect those. So um, yeah. kudos to you for, you know, for doing that work and, and um, staying on yep. it. I, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hopefully the community gets on it because I mean, they're going to be the key because I mean, they're the ones that own those properties that are where those warehouses that work, that work at these warehouses or see them flying out at night of those parking lot structures who knows and without their help we're not going to be able to find a lot of these really important roofs um so hopefully they they respond to our call to action to report these roofs to us so we can we can start beginning to map them out cool so we have just a, a few more minutes i'll try to get through these last couple of questions that we have um Somebody was asking about the the expenses for a long term, you know, like a year long monitoring effort, like you've been doing in LA. What what are the what are the major expenses, and did were there any you know surprising expenses that you that you guys had? For us, I mean, it's just how hard it is to get, uh, how much time it takes to get through all these back calls. I mean, it's just people power that is so important and the community scientists obviously have a vital role with providing us with access to unprecedented habitat in urban areas um, but to manage all this data after we get that access that is coming in um, is a big challenge and so and it's it's not just oh i'll just get some more volunteers to go through this data it takes special training to go and analyze these calls and, and um, make sure that they're double, triple checked so that we're not misidentifying species. Um, so it just takes a long time um, to get through that and you get thousands of calls. And in urban environments, um, compared to more rural bat studies, you get all this ambient noise. So processing that and, and scrubbing out all the traffic noise and sprinklers and all this other human human made uh, noise uh, takes an extra amount of time as well. So that that's that's the cost um, that we weren't really expecting as much. Uh, we should have expected it, but we weren't. Uh, especially as you get even more urban, just the the types of noise and sound that just increases. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it seems like it's been a lot of a lot of fun, you know, doing that that work. I I see those photos, and again, that photo of you at, at the stadium is just uh, iconic. I mean, so Thank so you. cool. Um, you know, somebody was asking about bats and coronavirus, and there was a lot of talk about that. I think at the beginning of the pandemic, when when there's a, I mean, there's still a lot of research being done trying to figure out exactly how COVID, um, you know, the corona the the virus that that causes COVID, how it's where it started, you know, how it, how it got into humans. And um, I remember there were some, some interesting reports around that time that sort of linked COVID to deforestation in, in certain areas, like in China, yeah. um, because yeah. it, you just have bats that can carry coronaviruses and they are being pushed in, you know, they're being, uh, they're, they're losing habitat. Humans are kind of moving into their, their spaces and, and, and there's more opportunity for that sort of mingling of, of species. Um, I don't know if you know anything more about that, but. I mean, I, I, as far as that story, like, I think, I mean, in addition to the risks that you just mentioned, the risk is also heightened where these, there's countries that have these wet markets and not only are they, um, collecting these poor bats for the pet trade or excuse me the bushmeat trade um, but they're putting in very awful conditions and and in busy markets where they're not in the best health because they're in these little traps or, or cages and not really taken care of um, and close to each one another these bats are close to one another and also of course if it's a busy market close to people as well and so um, that just heightens the level of danger. Um, and so for the, the risk in, in LA, or excuse me, in the United States, it's, it's diminished because we don't have those wet markets. We're not as close in contact with bats. Um, and there hasn't been a bat, to my knowledge, detected with, with coronavirus in, in North America. Um, and um, and also the type of bat um, that is 
linked to it, the horseshoe bat just doesn't occur here in North America either. So um, anyway, there's there's lots of reasons why we're we should be more afraid of each other and our behavior um, than than bats regarding uh, coronavirus exposure. I I completely agree with you there. Um, th this is a question I think a couple of people have asked: Are, are bats primates or rodents? That's that's um, that's a, that's a common a common question. Yeah, it's, it's they're neither. Um, okay. they, a lot of people think they're they're rodents. Um, they're they're just closely more closely related, to like insectivores and um, like basically like insect eating mammals that basically evolved to go to the sky so that they didn't have to compete with these ground dwelling insect eaters. So um, so yeah, not related to either. I mean, they're mammals, but they're not rodents or. Or, uh, know. They're, they're not flying rodents, as I think oh, my yeah. young self used to think. Um, oh, same um, here, same here. Yeah, I, especially like the, the myotis uh, bat, like that's Latin for mouse-eared bat. And so like they, they look, uh, as they have features of rodents, but I don't blame people, um, but it's just not the case. Rodents have like those major incisors um, right. and no, there's not a bat that has that. So um, bats are just something unique. They're their own thing, and <laughs> it's all the more reason to to love them uh, or to appreciate them. So uh, somebody asked, "Have you seen bats roosting in billboards, like um, like along freeways in LA, for example?" No, nah, but I, we need to start searching those types of places because they're. I mean, what they're going after are these crevices that are small and dark enough to make them comfortable and provide them with insulation during the day um but that's too small for i mean not too small for them that's big enough for them to cram themselves into but not too big so that a predator can get them um so i think anything like that i mean like i showed you that that towway sign like if they can cram behind that type of thing and multiple individuals are behind that then who knows what else they're they're roosting behind uh, on a regular basis? It's pretty amazing. Interesting. Please don't. <laughs> I, I am not a big fan of billboards, but this I guess will make me feel a little bit better if I think that they're yeah. you know, maybe they're bats <laughs> utilizing them. Um, don't write them off just yet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I won't. I won't. I won't just yet. Okay. Um, you know, somebody asked. You mentioned white nose white nose syndrome so if you're if you're from out east and you especially from like the ozark mountains or appalachia i mean anywhere where there's a lot of limestone a lot of karst you know cave systems you probably have seen if, if you've been out there recently you would see signs that say you know this cave system is closed to to public use because of white nose syndrome um because it's so easily can be spread uh you know, by humans actually on, on our clothes and in our shoes and stuff. So uh, it's really unfortunate to hear that that has made its way to California. And somebody asked where, you said Northern California, there was a bat that had been well, The fungus that causes it. Um, oh, okay. Um, so why it knows to my knowledge, I mean, hasn't been confirmed yet. I could be outdated with that knowledge, but I believe it was, um, is it Lassen? Something I, I don't know. Somewhere in Northern that's California. Somewhere, yeah, that's that's definitely up up there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it was somewhere around there. Interesting. Okay. There's well, a good LA Times article that that talks about that. It's just one of those things. It's it's why monitoring and and data collection are so important uh, is to try to keep track of you yeah know, if that is if that is making its way into California and, and moving among bat populations because it really is a pretty serious problem out east and yeah uh, yeah fingers crossed i mean because of the behavior of our local bats and the climate here um hopefully they're less vulnerable if that ever kind of reaches this region so it also seemed like it was it was affecting cave dwelling bats a little bit more mm -hmm. yeah and, exactly and i don't think we have as much of a i mean i know there are cave dwelling bats in in California, but I think they tend to be more tree roosting type bats, I, th I think, but 
Um, and also you mentioned earlier that all of the bats in LA County are insectivores. And I'm, I think that might be a, the tr- might be true for all bats in California period. I don't know if we have yeah. any. Well, we have some, some nectar feeding bats. So like we do. The okay. Log nose bat is in orange County. Okay. I'm oh, not wow. familiar with Ventura, Ventura species, but, um, or Santa Barbara County species, but, um, I definitely know, um, that there's definitely Mexican long nose bats, uh, which are those nectar feeding bats in Orange County for sure. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Also, oh, they're really close. I mean, they're in Southern California, so they they could be. Yeah. Yeah. They could be anywhere. <laughs> um. Cool. Okay. Well, it, you know, it's it's uh it's seven thirty. It's been an hour and a half. I think uh, there are a couple of questions I wasn't able to to get to. Uh, <laughs> um, actually, somebody did ask if someone doesn't want them for whatever reason in their, you know, their, their structure, the garage or whatever, I mean, is there a way, a non-toxic, non-lethal way to, de- to deter them? Not to deter them, but I mean, I think there's a, I think that, I think that the, it's still like not confirmed whether there's these like speakers or pulses you can create, uh, if those really work or not. Um, but I know that um, another way to do it is like one way doors. So like, um, you know, where they're emerging from, create like some sort of door where they can exit, but not come back into. Um, uh, yeah, other than that, yeah, I think that's, that's all I know about, but there's, I'm sure there's people on this, in, on this uh, Zoom that, that have other ideas to how to humanely get rid of them um, or ha- ask them not to come come back. But I'll, I'll share one, one story that I heard from a, a colleague of mine was that um, this individual, this homeowner loved bats and, and was not against bats at all, but these bats were just making a mess of her front porch and pooping and just really just got too much for this individual, I guess, uh, or too annoying. And so she asked some bat experts how to humanely get rid of them. I think they create a one-way door or something like that. And, um, and then they worked apparently. And, but I guess a few months later or something like that, somewhere around there, um, she called these bat experts back because she used that space in the evening to have wine or to kind of um, uh, take a break uh, in the evening time and she was just getting eaten alive by mosquitoes um, and and so she asked them like hey how can I reverse this and um, so when but so the warning here is that yes you could just have just more mosquito activity if you get rid of these these bats, but on top of that, if you change your mind, it's hard to reverse that. Even if you remove that one-way door, they might be hesitant to come back. So think really hard before you decide to exclude bats from your property. Yeah, it's uh, um, be careful what you wish for sometimes. I mean, it's <laughs> the same with people who get try to get rid of snakes on their property um, and then and then have trouble with, with rodent populations and, and things like that. Uh, okay, so somebody, we have one person who has actually raised their hand. Lori, I, I'm going to allow you to talk. But you're the only person that has done this. So I, I oh, no, you, you put your hand down. Okay, fine. <laughs> That's all right. Um, well, look, I think we've, we've gotten through most of the questions. I cannot express my appreciation enough for you spending another evening with, with us and with so many people. Uh, this has been incredible. I mean, I, I always learn so much from you, Miguel, and I know our staff at Forest to Watch is always just obsessed with your uh, with your work. And I, I, most of my coworkers actually were here uh, in the audience watching, and they um, they they loved it as always. And, and we're getting a lot of a lot of thank yous, and um, you know, people are people really like this. So again, thank you for for joining us. It, it has been a real pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for creating these events um, and and focusing on these type of topics and um, because it, it makes an impact. Um, so many people um, learning about these things and awareness, but also there are a lot of people will be motivated to be better stewards and neighbors to 
these animals that we talk about in these presentations. So I really appreciate that opportunity. We're going to have a, we're going to make some t-shirts at some point that talk about, we'll have some cool bat stuff and maybe mountain lions and maybe that photo of you holding up. It's like, you know, what it reminds me of is um, like the John Cusack holding up the, um, <laughs> the, the stereo and, and say anything. Yeah, like, uh, yeah. That's, that's what it's, it's given me that vibe for oh, some reason. Uh, I could just I'm see a romantic. I don't yeah, know. exactly. That's yeah. exactly right. You just, you love the bats. <laughs> um, okay. So for those of you watching at home, uh, after this has already happened, you're watching our recording, you should be able to find some cool links about bats, uh, maybe some links on where to find bat detectors and, um, and, and a link to uh, the, the Natural History Museum, Natural History, oh my gosh, I can't speak, Natural History Museum of LA County. Uh, and so you can see more of Miguel's work and uh, just, you know, look, look below this video somewhere or, or above it, uh, you will find some cool info. And this is where I'm going to end it. Uh, so I'm going to end the recording. Thank you all for, for joining us. And we'll see you next time.